Okay, um, we are ready for the second talk of the workshop, second talk of this morning. This is Professor Ristarik, Slovak mathematician, professor in computer science here at, uh, at, uh, at KAUST, and uh, well known for his contributions to stochastic optimization with applications to machine learning and other areas. So uh, with that, I think with a much, much of a ado, Peter, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, uh, excellent workshop and welcome to KAUST. Hopefully you'll have a beautiful two weeks. Um, so I work in uh, stochastic optimization, randomized methods, distributed methods, uh, fairy learning, uh, foundations of SGD uh, and, and, and questions of this type. And in this talk, I wish to share some recent results uh, from early this year. Uh, and as you can see from the title of the talk, which is the same as the title of the paper, we're quite excited about the results. Normally we don't do that, even when we're excited, but this time we just, I don't know, somehow decided we'll have a funny title for a paper. So as researchers, we spend a lot of time thinking about things. So sometimes it's good to have fun. So yes, the uh, title has, uh, several exclamation marks, um, and I'll explain why we're so excited uh, shortly. So, uh, so this paper either is or is not accepted to ICML, depending on, uh, uh, so for those of you who submitted to, to International Conference of Machine Learning, you know that uh, there was some kind of leakage of information. Uh, you can log in and see the results, and then they they, they close the result and the announcements will only come. So I just accept or not depending on whether I, I should believe what, uh, what I saw. Okay, uh, so just got, got accepted to ICML. So maybe, maybe not, we'll see. <laughs> uh, so there's an alternative title also. Uh, so let's say more scholarly title, which we have here in the footnotes. You can think of this as a paper with two titles. So the alternative title would be Proskip breaking the communication barrier of local gradient methods. Okay, so this joint work with uh, some excellent co-authors, two of which are uh, affiliated with KAUST or were at the time of uh, uh, much of this research. So Konstantin Mishenka was a PG student. He finished in December and now he's a postdoc in Paris in the group of Alex Aspremo and Francis Bach. Uh, Grisha Malinowski is a PG student here at KAUST and Sebastian Stick is a long-term collaborator. Um, so I'll spend most of my talk talking about stuff which doesn't even mention that much the results because I want to motivate things properly because I understand uh, uh, that uh, this is important in this case. Um, and then uh, uh, as, as we go along, I'll, I'll, I'll actually get to those results uh, near the end. And I would welcome uh, interaction throughout the talk. So if you have any questions at any point in time, I'm doing this for the audience. I hope you'll get something out of this. So first, let's, uh, let's uh, get to the same uh, page. So gradient descent, I hope everybody knows about gradient descent, but in the off chance you don't know, I have one slide on it. So here's gradient descent. Uh, you want to minimize a function. This is d-dimensional function. Uh, and you subtract from the current iterate multiple of the gradient of the function and you hope that you get to the minimum. So this is a non-convex function. So probably you'll not get to the minimum, maybe to some local minimum, but that's what you're really hoping for. Uh, so in some sense, you can think of this as some kind of discretization of, of a gradient flow, but uh, uh, we like to think of this as a discrete algorithm and we like to think about efficiency, how many steps you need to solve the problem and the, the less steps you need, the better. All right, so now this gamma is called a learning rate or step size and so on and so forth. There's a lot of research just on that. Uh, you will see there's no subscript here, T, for the learning rate because for all the theory that we have and all the purposes of this talk, we just need a fixed constant step size. So we'll not need to uh, come up with any elaborate step size schedule. So this is typically a good thing. If you can have a gradient type method work with a non-decreasing step size, that means something is good, okay? For instance, SGD will not work 
unless you're very lucky with the uh, fixed step size rule. You have to be in the overparameterized regime, interpolation regime, or you have to introduce variance reduction or something like this in order for, the, for, for fixed step size to work. All right, so the first question I want to ask here to introduce uh, really the, the topic of discussion is how would we implement gradient send in a distributed environment? Because this talk is going to be about distributed training and communication efficient distributed training. And gradient ascent is not a method that people use in distributed environment because it's way too simplistic. But all the methods that people use, if you forget about the second order methods, are some kind of variants of uh, gradient ascent. So there are improvements on gradient ascent. And what I'm going to talk about is also some sort of improvement on gradient ascent. So I want everybody to be on the same page of what is the difficulty. So, we will be solving this distributed optimization problem. So we are trying, trying to train a supervised machine learning model over N machines. So N is the number of machines or devices or clients, workers. In federal learning, uh, this is a very famous problem and N is typically in the millions. So, so N is really, really large. On a supercomputer, maybe it would be tens or, or hundreds, but in federal learning, it could be millions. It could be cell phones, number of cell phones. And you want to jointly train a single machine learning model parameterized by this vector x, which is d-dimensional. And you want to do this in a communication efficient manner. So uh, in this talk, I will not assume any kind of data similarity. So, so quite typically in distributed training, distributed optimization, you would assume that these functions fi's are similar in some sense but we don't need that, so we can work with arbitrarily different functions, and, and that's, an important, that's an important characteristic of, of this talk. All right, so how would we do this? Well, this is gradient ascent, so you take the gradient of the average of functions, so here's a reminder, this average of functions, and the gradient of the average is the average of gradients. Obviously, the way to implement this is that uh, each client i, each worker i, computes the gradient, because it can, because it owns function fi. So we'll assume that the function fi is owned by client i. Uh, so that's what it can do. But uh, the, then this averaging process has to happen. But the averaging process involves all the clients. So we need to average uh, n d-dimensional vectors. That looks like a trivial operation. Everybody knows how to do averaging. But if you are in a distributed computing environment, you know that averaging involves communication and communication is typically the bottleneck. That's the slowest thing. Typically you have fast computers, but communication is super, super slow. So that will be the bottleneck, that will be the problem. So let's write down distributed gradient ascent, which is just gradient ascent with, with, with this funny um, adjective distributed, but it's really just gradient ascent. Let's uh, write it down in a little bit different way. It's still the same method, but it will help me explain the basic uh, idea of so-called local gradient ascent, which is the method we're trying to improve on. So we have three workers and a server. In theory learning, this is called the orchestrating or aggregating server. That's the hub of communication. So these workers, let's say they are your cell phones, they cannot communicate in between each other uh, individually, but they can communicate with some kind of a server somewhere. And through that server, they effectively communicate. So the server does the averaging. So all of these uh, clients receive the current um, model, xt, or iterate vector xt. Then they create a copy of this. This is just for mathematical purposes. So of course, they don't have to create a copy. But I want, I want these xt's to suddenly be uh, different. And then uh, each machine takes one gradient step only based on the local function. OK? That's it. One gradient step, not even SGDs. One gradient step based on. Uh, the local function. And then these uh, final uh, iterates, they get sent to the server. And now this is D dimension, these are D dimensional vectors, right? D could be huge, and this is where the bottleneck is. And then these uh, three vectors get averaged. And uh, if you look at the average, that is just the same thing as doing gradient ascent on the average of the function. So this is just a strange way of writing down gradient ascent. You see, this is still gradient ascent. So we didn't do really anything, but but we're thinking of it slightly differently. We're thinking of it from the point of view of each device. So each device just receives a model, takes a gradient step, sends the model to the server, server averages, and so on, okay? All right, so what is the problem with this? Well, and, and after this, so one, one last thing, this, this model is sent back to the devices and the process is repeated. So this is just gradient ascent. So what is the problem with this? The problem is that 
in distributed training in general and in federal learning in particular, these arrows are the most expensive things here. Everything else is, is uh, comparatively cheap. And, and they're so expensive that nobody would actually do this uh, in practice. So this is just not efficient. So we need to do something about this, okay? So what is the simplest thing you can think of? Uh, uh, what is the simplest possible fix for this that you can think of? Well, actually there's a simple fix which was proposed uh, some time ago. You can date it back to maybe 1995 or 2014, this was rediscovered. So this idea was rediscovered a few times and, and the method uh, was not named this way at that point in time, but now we call it uh, local gradient descent. So what is local gradient descent? It's almost the same method, which is one little change. And the change is when you take this gradient step locally on each device, you don't stop, but you say, wait a minute. So this gradient step took me a second and now I'll wait for a day to communicate. This doesn't seem like a right balance between computation and communication. So maybe I should just take more gradient steps because then this will take like an hour or a couple hours or something. And then maybe something good happens that way. So I try to avoid immediate communication after one gradient step, okay? So you take another gradient step and another and so on. And you take, let's say capital K gradient steps. Okay, so this is the local gradient descent method because everybody locally runs gradient descent on their local function for a number of steps. And only after a certain fixed number of steps, the averaging happens, okay? Because after this, the averaging happens. So uh, these uh, models are sent to the server, server averages, sends back. So if capital K is uh, one, then this is the same method as before. This is just distributed gradient descent. So this is generalization of gradient descent, okay? So let me stop here for a second in case anybody has any question about uh, anything that I talked about so far. Yes. Yeah, so that could be a problem, absolutely. So if the number of steps is infinite, right? Then everybody just minimizes their function fi, right? And if you then do averaging, then you get average of the minima. And then you repeat it, everybody goes, takes infinitely many steps. So somehow the process doesn't improve. And all that you find is the average of the minima, which obviously is not the minimum of the average, right? So, so, so taking many steps will definitely be bad, right? But the question is, uh, what should be the right number of steps? And, and the one step is also bad because you comp your computation is so fast and communication is so slow that uh, it's not efficient, right? So there should be some kind of a good number of local steps, which is not one of infinity. Okay. Yeah, excellent question, yes. So, um... Thank you. So why do you assume that um, all the workers have to go capital K steps? Uh, isn't it the waiting time for each worker is different? Absol uh, absolutely. So, so I want, to, I want to assume the mathematically simple scenario first. I'm assuming the workers are equally fast, okay? And they take the same number of steps just for simplicity because we don't even understand that scenario. In practice, they might have different speeds. They might have different amounts of data and so on and so forth. So all of those things are completely valid concerns and research is being done in that direction. But uh, even this scenario, we don't understand why this works. And that's actually the big question in this talk. Why does something like this work? Because there's no theory which says that this should work better than taking one steps. The theory doesn't exist. Despite this being uh, having been studied, and in fact, this is the workhorse of federal learning. It, everybody sees in practice it works, but there's no theory. I'm not, I'm not saying there's no theory. There is theory, but no theory which says it's better than taking case equal to one. And that's really, really troubling, right? Mm, of course. Absolutely, that's uh, another thing that people are working on. So these are some edge devices, but you could think of this worker as being some kind of uh, country specific device. And then beneath that worker, there's lots of other devices and so on. So you can think of a whole, whole network, but I want to think simplistically. So we have just this very simple star shaped tree here. 
and that's it. But yes, so one can think more complicated things. But again, the, the, the questions that I'm going to ask are not even known in this setting. So all of these extensions is fine. And there's a lot of work on decentralized optimization of arbitrary networks. But even there, it, it is not known uh, whether these local steps will help. So the underlying assumption that you have identical kind of uh, distribution or system? No, no, no. That's ex exactly what I don't have. No, okay, no, no. So I don't have that assumption. So this is one of the early approaches to understanding. So you're already kind of in your mind doing, write, rewriting some of these papers that some people have written, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, yes, so if the functions are very, very similar or identical, then there's no need to communicate at all, right? Because everybody owns the same function. Mm -hmm. So we just say, I just minimize it. And the minimum is going to be the minimum of the average, right? And if they're very similar, probably many local steps help. But uh, we want to specifically work in the regime where they're arbitrarily different. Mm -hmm. okay? okay. So yes, there were some early approaches to this and early theory, which said, if the functions are similar and very similar, these things help. But in practice, they're not. So there's a problem. OK, very good. Thanks for the engagement. So, so that's really the problem. Why does something like this work? So let me overview, overview very briefly the history of this. So everything starts with Cauchy. We know that. Uh, in 95, something that's very, very similar to local GD was proposed by Olvi Mangasarian. Uh, and in 2014, 15, 17, I'm mentioning this 2017 work because that's where, where uh, this uh, uh, approach rose to prominence, but this was independently discovered before. This kind of take many local training steps and then average, okay, avoid communication. In this paper by Brandon McMahon and Cotters, so this is one of the four papers that started federal learning in 2016, but this was published in 2017. So they proposed the ferreted averaging algorithm, which if you remove two things which don't help the algorithm theoretically, Okay, the, the, the three components of the method, you remove two things which only make it worse theoretically, then it's exactly the method that I just described. So this uh, local gradient and method. And, and there's no theory in this paper, just, just some numerical results which says this is really helping. Uh, and it speeds up the communication by factors of 10 or 100. So this helps a lot. So then uh, only to 2020 in this work with Ahmed Khaled, uh, Konstantin Mishenko, we have shown that this local uh, gradient method actually works without assuming any degree of similarity. So that was the first paper which uh, showed that uh, you don't have to assume similarity, but the results were pessimistic. So we had analysis, so now we know the method will work if uh, the data or functions are arbit arbitrarily dissimilar, but the results were it's worse than gradient descent, which is really, really troubling again because so of course, it's a step in the right direction before we didn't even know that, that it works for arbitrarily different functions, but it's still worse than gradient descent. but everybody says it's better in practice. So what, what the hell is going on? Okay, so why does this work? Uh, if you look at the, the at, at from an empirical point of view, you see pictures of this type. So just, just for you to get an intuition. So if you take one local step, you get gradient descent, and there's the blue line, and you can see the gradient descent can achieve any kind of accuracy. Uh, because let's say for this kind of a problem, which is a smooth, strongly convex problem, the convergence rate will be linear, which means the error will decay exponentially fast. However, if you take, let's say, 32 local steps, so that's the uh, local gradient standard with 32 local steps, what happens is that the initial convergence is much, much faster, but then it gets stuck at some, at some neighborhood of the solution. But if, if that kind of accuracy is all that you need, then you're good to go, right? That's much better than, than this. However, and, and then if you take, let's say, four local steps, then, then of course, uh, four local steps would be optimal if the accuracy you're aiming for is something like 10 to the power, power minus whatever, 4.5 or something, right? And so, so depending on the accuracy you're aiming, uh, you should choose this number of local steps. However, even this picture is observed in, 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 in practice, but this is not supported by theory. There's no theory which says that the convergence should be faster than gradient descent. So somehow in theory, this is different. They all should be worse than gradient descent and they should stuck, get stuck sooner. So, so that's what we observe, but uh, okay. Anyway, but this, just, just for you to get a feel for what's going on. And of course, it's also troubling that the method just stops working at some accuracy, right? So that's, that's uh, also troubling, but this was fixed recently in the last couple of years. Okay, so this was fixed in these linearly converging 
local GD methods, yes? Okay, so, so well, this was not known why at that time, so this was just observed empirically, but I can give you some kind of in intuition from the theory of SGD, which doesn't apply here, but, but something similar happens. So if you're on SGD and you have more noise, then you, you observe the same picture actually as this. So you converge in some sense faster, but uh, to a worse solution. It's something like that is happening, yeah. I don't see similarity, no. But maybe there is, I just don't see it. Maybe we can talk about it later. Okay, good. So, uh, so these linear converging methods, they fix the issue that the, the, the method gets stuck at these local uh, neighborhoods. And you can see here on this uh, picture that uh, LGD, local gradient set gets stuck, there's the red line, but these two, uh, these two linearly converging methods, scaffold and LGD star, they actually keep going, right? They keep going now. So then some sort of modification had to happen in these methods to make them work like this, but still the theory for these methods is worse than gradient descent. So there's yet another generation of, of understanding, but they're still worse than gradient descent in theory, but at least they, they don't get stuck, okay? So, so you can see that there's, there's this, Excitement, we make a step, but it's still worse than green sand. And then we make a step, we improve something, it's still worse than green sand, and so on. Always worse than green sand. So Scaffold is a super uh, famous paper, uh, even though it's just two years old. Uh, and uh, it's performing very well, much better than actually the theory supporting the method. And then there are these two other uh, linearly convergent methods. This, this one is from our lab. Okay, so, so, so this is, this is the kind of latest generation of these local gradient time methods. And if you want to have some kind of understanding why this linear convergence there um, kicks in, it's because some sort of variance reduction technique is, is used there, okay? But it's not the classical variance reduction technique because there's no stochasticity to talk of. It's the, it's the variance which is called client drift. So these machines take these multiple uh, gradient steps and they all converge to different uh, vectors, and you can think of the of the variance of those vectors as uh, you know, if, if this was empirical variance. So that's that's the that's the variance because the the you're averaging vectors which are not the same. Okay, so it is a variance reduction for that uh, that thing. It's called client drift reduction. Okay, so that's what was discovered a couple of years ago. But as I said, still the theory is worse than gradient descent. So what we ask in this paper, and what I'm going to talk, tell you about in this in this solve is that there was this, there's this very important gap in our understanding of why local steps help. And there's no, not a single paper which would say that they help. There's a lot of understanding. We're getting closer and closer and closer, but there's no, 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 no understanding why this helps, why it's better than a single step. Uh, so is the situation hopeless or can we, can we fix it somehow? So the, so the answer is all on this. Uh, one slide, so you can ignore the rest of the talk if, 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 if you uh, suffer through this one slide. So the answer is yes, we can design a new method, which is uh, local in nature, and which actually shows that what you get is better than gradient descent, and not just a little bit, but by a lot. And by a lot, I mean, instead of dependence, linear dependence on the condition number, which is what uh, gradient descent uh, has, something like O kappa, kappa is some sort of smoothness constant divided by strong convexity, something like this times log one or epsilon, that's linear convergence. You have dependence on the square root of the condition number. So that's, that, this is of course a huge improvement and we're very happy that uh, we obtained this result. And that means that these local steps, in fact, they provide for, a, for a, an acceleration, communication acceleration mechanism. That's what's happening through these local steps. But we had to redesign the things uh, in some way. Yes, Sasha. Uh, how would it define? <sighs> right, well, it's defined in a little bit different way in every paper. <laughs> okay, so that's, the, that's why I'm not really talking about it. So here in the gradient descent, obviously this is just the Lipschitz constant of the gradient divided by the strong convexity constant. There's the classical condition number. So if the, if the function was uh, 
strongly convex quadratic, there would be the largest eigenvalue divided by the smallest eigenvalue. So that's what it would have been in this case. And in all of these cases, it's something similar, but typically slightly worse than this. So I, I use the same kappa there, but this here, the kappa is slightly worse than that kappa. But I don't want to get into these details, okay? So, so it's not even matching gradient descent. It looks like it is. I wanted to give these methods benefit of the doubt, but this kappa is even slightly worse than this kappa. Okay, uh, all right. So, so what we actually prove is something stronger than this result. What we prove is uh, this kind of result. What does this mean? So what we do, we don't take fixed number of local steps, this capital K. What we do is that every machine flips uh, a coin with probability P, think of P being very small, something like one over capital K. And with that probability, it will say, I'm going to communicate now. So with very small probability, it will communicate. And with very large probability, well, one minus P, it will just take another gradient step. And these coin flips are synchronized across these machines. So somehow everybody takes exactly the same number of local steps. Okay, so you can do this by, you know, uh, either the server can communicate to everybody, should you communicate or not, okay, using some, you know, bit information, or they can have the same seed or something like this, okay? Let's not worry about this at the moment. So, uh, so since this happens with probability P, uh, all these machines, they take a random number of local steps, but on expectation is one over P steps, right? So if the probability is small, they take a lot, lot of steps. And what we prove is that the number of communication runs for this kind of a technique is p times kappa plus one over p. That's what it is. So if, if, if you set p is equal to one, what do you get? You get kappa, right? There's this kind of gradient descent, right? But what happens if p is smaller than one? Just look at this function. This is a convex function of p, right? This is linear, this is one over p, right? So the dependence here starts improving on kappa as p goes smaller from one, right? And it starts getting worse here. But at some point, these two curves meet, and there's the optimal choice of p. And the optimal choice of p, actually, the p that minimizes this simple univariate convex function, is exactly one, one over square root of the condition number. OK? And that's how we get this result. So, so really, what's, what's going on here is that we show that you, all of these machines, they should take square root of condition number local gradient steps. OK? If they do that, then then you get communication acceleration. Yes. O tilde, all of all of all O tilde, there's log uh, one over epsilon hidden. Yeah. So that's linear convergence. I because it's the same everywhere, I hide it. It's not the same here, where you have one over epsilon, so sublinear dependence on epsilon, so that's much worse. And this is what these local gradient ascent looks like, the, the, the theory for the method that I showed on the slide, which doesn't do this client rift reduction, which is not linearly convergent. But once you do this client rift reduction, whatever it is, I, there's not the point of this talk, you get the log one of epsilon, but it's still worse than gradient ascent. Yeah. Yes. 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 No, we don't think so because th there is optimal first order methods. There's the literature of optimal first order methods and, uh, and uh, let's say Nestor of accelerated gradient ascent. And uh, the theory says that the optimal uh, choice is uh, the optimal uh, complexity is squared of uh, kappa. So we believe this is optimal. So you can think of this as an alternative mechanism to Nestor of acceleration to accelerate things. But we'll be accelerating, we accelerate in communication complexity. We're not accelerating, let's say, the number of iterations of this method if you count the local iterations as well. Because in some sense, we don't care about the number of local iterations. We assume there are, the local iterations are cheap. So we're optimizing the number of communications, not the number of iterations, right? Square root of kappa local iterations is a lot, right? Okay. So if you compare to Nestor acceleration, we can see what we get is something better. Uh, so uh, it has, in some sense, the same theory, but Nestor of acceleration is, is not a local method, but, uh, but uh, somehow this local training thing is a very interesting acceleration mechanism. It's quite surprising. Okay, 
So now, uh, how do we actually approach this theoretically? So, so this was the problem that we that we're looking at, minimizing the average, and we think of this as distributed problem over n workers or clients or machines. And uh, we're not going to attack it this way. We're going to attack it through a reformulation. This reformulation is standard, but it's not standard in the works that study these local methods. It's standard in general in distributed optimization. So we didn't invent anything new here, but uh, we realized that it's important to study this problem from this point of view. So we create freedom for every client by saying, you have your own variable xi, and there's no connection to the other variables, right? But then we take the freedom away by adding a penalty, which says, unless all of these models are the same, you're going to pay infinity price. Okay, so that's, so this is completely equivalent, right? Completely equivalent. Because uh, in order to minimize this, this yellow penalty has to be zero because uh, minimum of no function is going to be plus infinity if it has finite values. So this has to be zero, which means all the exercises have to be the same, right? Okay, so, so this is how we're going to look at things. But we're going to look at things at a slightly higher level of generality than this, because we uh, realize that in fact, the way you can think of this uh, penalty is that you have zero value for some, on some set and infinity outside of the set. So let's just put some general closed convex set here. Okay, so this is just a particular closed convex set, which says all of these things are the same. And let, let's, let's generalize to any closed convex set. And in fact, let's generalize even one step further. Let's generalize this to a function, which is proper closed and convex function with the, which can achieve the values plus infinity. So the, the previous examples are special cases of this. Okay, so the, a function is closed and convex if the epigraph of the function is closed, is closed and convex. Epigraph is the whole thing above the graph. So that's it above the graph. Okay, so let me pause here. So this is what we're going to look at. This kind of uh, uh, problem. Minimize f plus, uh, plus a regularizer, which is closed, uh, proper, and convex. Okay, so... Uh, so when we look at uh, problems of this type, so th of this type, minimize a smooth, nice function and some nasty regularizer, which may not be differentiable at all, right? This is the zero infinity function could be, right? Then uh, what kind of tools do we have in optimization to solve such problems? We do have tools. In fact, there is a more general method than gradient descent, which solves these kinds of problems, and it's called proximal gradient descent. So there's a method that solves this. How does the method look like? I'll dis describe it on the next slide, but the but I will also talk about its theory. And for the theory, you need this smooth function to be L smooth, so in the sense that it's differentiable and the gradient is uh, L uh, Lipschitz. And what you want also is for the function to be strongly convex with modulus uh, mu. So you can write this equivalently by saying that the Bregman divergence is upper and lower bounded by these two quadratics. Okay, and this uh, regularizer is going to be proper closed convex function, as I promised. Right, and keep in mind that uh, indicator of a closed convex set is a non empty closed convex set is a proper closed convex. But on top of this, we want this function to be proximal. What, what does proximability mean? It means that you can easily solve, evaluate this proximity operator. So what is proximity operator is, is uh, if you want to minimize some function, it may be difficult, right? But, uh, but some functions, they have simple minimizers, and some functions, they are simply minimized even if you perturb them by a quadratic. So the proximity operator of a function is nothing else than the minimum. Uh, it is a mapping which maps x to the minimum minimizer of this quadratically perturbed function, version of the function. Okay, so obviously most functions, they are not proximal, but some very simple functions are. So let's say if this is, uh, let's say, just uh, L1 norm of u, there's a closed form solution for this, and it's called soft thresholding. For instance, if this is the indicator function of a closed convex set, just as was in our case, this is just the projection operator onto that closed convex set. Okay. All right. So, what is the generalization of gradient descent? So, this is just textbook material to this uh, proximal problem. It's called proximal gradient descent. Then you first take gradient step, pretending there is no bad. Uh, penalty, okay? But then 
after you take the gradient step, you take the prox operator, right? So, so for instance, if you want to minimize functions subject to a convex constraint, then you can just take gradient step. It may take you outside of the convex constraint and the proximity operator of that function, which is the indicator function of the closed convex set is just the projection operator. So it will project this step back onto that closed convex set. So this is then projected gradient descent, okay? So you can think of this as generalization of projected gradient descent. Okay, so this is kind of the fundamental tool we have at our disposal if we want to solve problems of this form. And now we reformulated our problem into this form. So how are we going to solve this? Well, where is this difficulty in, in uh, gradient descent? Where does it lie? Well, it lies in the, in the proximity operator. Why? Because proximity operator of this set, I'll, I'll go back, of, of this set, okay? Sorry, it's the proximity operator of the indicator function of this set, where, which we say all of these XIs are the same, is the projection onto that set, but projection means you average the XIs. And averaging of XIs is communication, right? So somehow, what I'm trying to say is that at this level of abstraction, if you apply uh, proximal gradient descent to this reformulation, then it is the prox evaluation of the proximity operator where the communication will happen, right? Because when you take the gradient step, since all the XIs are allowed to be different, when you take the gradient steps here, since all the XIs are allowed to be different, this is just everybody, all these clients take gradient step independently of each other. That's what it is. And then immediately after that, you do the proximity operator, which says average them now, which means communication. So this is just yet another funny way of just writing down distributed gradient descent, which says one gradient step, then average, one gradient step, average, right? So the difficulty is in the proximity operator, and that's exactly what we'll try to resolve. So we want a method which just doesn't, if, doesn't compute these proximity operators all the time. That's what we want, right? We will want to skip the proximity operator. So that's why our method is called proc skip. We just flip a coin, and with some very, very small probability, we evaluate the proximity operator. And with a very high probability, we just don't evaluate it. Okay, and that's how we would be then saving our communication. Okay, but let me first uh, say something about the theory of proximal gradient descent, uh, just for everybody to be on the same page. So if the number of iterations is at least condition number times log one or epsilon, and condition number is again this ratio L and mu, uh, an epsilon is a tolerance, then uh, the distance squared of the iterate xt from the solution, which in this case is unique because you have a strong convex function, it's just unique minimizer, is going to be below epsilon times some initial distance, okay? So you need condition number, uh, number of iterations, right? Uh, condition number times log one or epsilon. So this is all good, but this also means condition number of uh, proxy evaluations. That also means condition number of communications, and that's exactly great in the sand, and the, that's the bad thing, right? So how can we improve it? And I already said how we'll be skipping the proximity operator. So how do we do it? I'll, I'll describe it in two ways. The first way, I'll describe a simple, very, very simple method that everybody here will understand, uh, which skips all the proximity operators, all of them, completely. But it's totally useless because it's just a theoretical method that you cannot implement. But it will have the beautiful property that all the prox all the communication is completely magically disappears. But uh, it is because we kind of assume we know the solution in some sense. Okay, <laughs> you will see. But then this will be a good motivation for the actual method proxkip and for its development. So we use this kind of. We learn from this in order to, to, to suggest the fix. Okay, so let me first describe the simple approach. So what I'm going to say is that uh, completely re remove the psi, this penalty from the, from the problem, completely. There's no psi here. Instead, uh, perturb the function linearly with a very specific handcrafted uh, optimal perturbation where this H star just happens to be the gradient of the function at x star, where x star is the solution of the problem we're trying to solve. 
So, so this is, of course, circular reasoning. Like, we cannot actually do this, because for this, we would need to know the x star, and this is what we want to do. We want to find x star, right? But let's make that leap here just to see what would happen if we managed to do that. Well, if we had such h star, which we don't, then what I claim is just apply any method to this reformulation and you, and you find x star. Why? Because uh, you look at the, the first order optimality conditions. You just set the gradient to zero. Everything is convex here. And you see that x star definitely satisfies this equation. Right? Just set the gradient of this to zero. Gradient this has to be equal to h star. Gradient of f at x has to be equal to h star. So if you plug in x is equal to x star, definitely that is going to be the case. right? So, so you can solve this with just gradient descent, and then you, you never have to do any communication. So if you knew the solution, that's another big surprise, right? If you knew the solution to your problem, then you can just give this h star to all these clients. They will shift their function linearly, and from then on, they don't have to communicate. They just take infinity of local gradient steps with this shifted objective, right? Okay, so I'll pause here in case... Uh, any questions? Yeah, absolutely. The algorithm works under many settings in practice, but uh, there is no result even in the simplest strongly convex case, which would say it's better than taking just one local step. So somehow the trick works, but there's not a single setup in the arbitrarily heterogeneous data regime. There are some results when the functions are almost the same, but that's kind of understandable that such results should exist, right? Mm -hmm. Some kind of sensitivity analysis on everything is totally the same, right? Uh, but, uh, but the method works even in the arbitrarily heterogeneous data regime. In practice, it always helps to take multiple steps than one. There's no theory whatsoever that would suggest that it does. So that's what we're trying to resolve here. And for this, we focus on the simplest possible class of problems, which are L smooth and strongly convex, because even there, we don't understand it. And then the hope is that now maybe we have generated some tools that this could then be understood in the convex regime or non-convex and so on, that somehow more progress can be made. We're not definitely, we're not attacking the non-convex problem. We're not even attacking the convex problem. We're attacking the strongly convex problem. Seems to work even in the non-convex regime and for neural networks and all kinds of things. Yeah. Yes. So all the workers send in a synchronized fashion everything to the server. The server does the everything sends back. So of course, one can think of asynchronous things and so on, but that's just different trick. And we try to understand just the nature of this local training acceleration through local training in the purest possible setting. Yeah. So F is smooth, yeah. I don't know. I just don't know. So all of this is really for smooth. This is not such a big problem because uh, uh, even if you work with ReLU activation is for deep learning, then you can, you can smooth them up and things will be smooth. So smoothness is not, not really a big problem. Uh, the big problem is uh, the Lipschitz continuity of the gradient because for, let's say for neural networks, these Lipschitz constants either don't exist or they're absolutely astronomical. But we're not attacking deep learning here. We're attacking a much simpler problem, which is just strongly convex or smooth. It's much, we admit, it's a much simpler problem. But even for that, we don't know why this local work helps. So we want to understand it first in a simple setting because, uh, that's the only way we know how to make some progress. Okay, so does everybody understand this trick? You do linear perturbation and then just run a gradient descent and there's no communication needed whatsoever after this, right? Kind of, <laughs> okay. So, uh, so now what we're going to do and, and think, think of it this way, right? So the, we, we are applying this to the reformulated problem and the reformulated problem, you have the F here would be, would, would be of this structure. It would be sum of, let's, let's find that slide. The F there is of this structure, okay? And this is just completely gone. 
right? So applying gradient descent of this kind of a problem where all the exercises are different, it just means everybody just runs their own gradient descent on their own function. These are n completely decoupled problems, right? So that's why this is just the local gradient descent in its extreme. Just take as many steps as you can because you're just getting close to the solution. But we had to perturb these functions correctly at the beginning. Okay. Okay. So that's what that's what the message there is. That if you know how to perturb the functions correctly at the beginning, at all of these clients, then you don't need any communication whatsoever because that trick takes care of everything. Right. That's the message of this slide. You can think of it, but it's kind of regularization, which which is uh, supposed to kind of uh, couple the clients because they are not solving their independent problems. The the models they need to find the same model. You want to minimize average of fi's at x, and x should be the same. So so first you say you allow freedom, so the x size could be arbitrarily different, and then you regularize and say no no no, you will pay infinity penalty. And infinity uh, cost if they are even slightly different, so they have to be the same. So it's just a trick. It's just a mathematical trick, right? Uh, it will not be. Uh, so it will not be dead uh, in general because. Uh, because h star will be the vector of these gradients of fi at x star. Oh, okay. But there may be arbitrarily different. So the average will be zero, right? The, but, the, but the individual gradients at the optimum will not be zero. Okay. So, so this perturbation is not trivial. It's, it's an actual perturbation. So for each worker, you need to make the same fi? Exactly, exactly. So from the point of view of worker who, who has function fi, I want to perturb my function by a linear function whose gradient is the gradient of my own function at the optimal point that I don't know that we're trying to collectively find, right? So if you can do that, then you don't need any communication whatsoever. But of course, you don't know x star. You don't know the solution. You, want, you try to find it. So you cannot know the perturbation. But if you knew it, everything is solved. You don't have to communicate at all, right? So that's that's the idea here, right? So now, how do we fix it? Well, we need to somehow learn the h star on the fly, right? We don't know it, so maybe we can create the method which will produce a sequence of these perturbations, which will converge to h star, right? And if we do so, then maybe this helps us to save on communication. But in order to create such a sequence, you have to have access to, uh, to this psi, right? Because that's how x star is defined, right? h star is a function of x star, and x star is a function also of psi, of the regularizer, right? Of, of this non-smooth function. So you cannot learn h star without ever even touching psi, right? And touching psi means touching it through evaluating the proximity operator of the function, which means communication because that's averaging, right? So somehow we have to do some communication in learn in order to learn h star. But the question is, can we do that much, much faster than what proximal gradient descent does? So proximal gradient descent also learns this h star somehow, but very, very slowly, because it has to evaluate every single iteration, right? OK, so that's the idea. So, so from the point of view, every single machine, if they, if they perturb the gradient by appropriate h star, then they just run this method, right? But uh, we don't know the h star, so I already said that. And now our proposal is do something like this. Change this to ht and learn that ht somehow, right? So we desire for this ht to converge to h star, and the question is how can we actually do something like this? Okay, okay so. So the Prosky method is the answer to this question, and this is how it looks. It looks almost exactly as I just said, right? So you perturb by some HT, which I'm going to tell you how that updates, and you take this gradient step, and after every single such gradient step, which is just one gradient step on each client in parallel with their own shift HT, 
okay? Because this HT is a big dimensional vector composed of blocks of all of these individual shifts, right? Uh, what do we do? We flip a coin. And with some very high probability, okay, we just carry, carry on. Because P is very small, so one minus P is very large. So with very high probability, we just say that this hat thing, we just remove the hat, right? We just call it XT plus one, and we don't change the shift. What would that mean from the point of view of the learning? It would just mean take another gradient step locally, take another gradient step locally, take another gradient step locally, and use the same shift. Don't change the shift, right? And at some point, you, 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 you kick into this branch, so this, this event, this low probability event happens, and, and then all of the machines at the same time, they will update the shift, okay? Because that's how we we'll learn the shift, the optimal shift. And, and they do it through evaluating the proximity operator of psi, which means through communication, right? So that's what we do. They evaluate the proximity operator of psi. It turns out the right way to evaluate it is to evaluate the proximity operator of psi multiplied by the step size divided by the probability, okay? So there's some intuition behind this. And then we need to come up with uh, this, what, what these three question marks actually mean. How do we change the shift? How do we change then the xt plus one? It will not be xt plus one head because now it will depend on the prox as well. And prox of what we evaluate. But I don't want to give you answers to these three question marks in this talk because I think there's too much detail. I have them all in on this slide. So you can just look here and, and get the answers, right? But uh, I think it's much nicer to understand the method from this point of view. And uh, if you just believe me that you can plug in these three question marks and then you get the full description of the method, then, uh, then, then I'll be happy. Yes? So, uh, correct, so Yes, so it's some sort of drift reduction technique. So that is the kind of thing that I was describing before. So this HT is some sort of drift reduction technique. Uh, however, it's a new one. And it's before all the previous drift reduction techniques, they, they only led to linear rate, but worse than gradient descent, or at best matching gradient descent. This particular drift reduction technique is fundamentally different because the randomness here is the in the, in the evaluation of the proximity operator. So such methods, they don't belong to the class of SGD uh, methods because we're not approximating gradient of the smooth function. We are randomly evaluating the proximity operator of a non-smooth function. So it's, it's, it's a different randomness. Uh, but yes, this is drift reduction technique, but the right one, it turns out, okay? is the right one because through that one, we get communication acceleration. So this is the actual Prosky method. It's, it's quite simple. You can see there's this shift. This is what you evaluate the proximity operator at. This is how you update the HT plus one. So there are some simple formulas and so on. But uh, don't look at this, just look at this. All right, so now the theory. So what do we get? So now we can contrast it in your mind to the theory that we had for proximal gradient ascent. So what we get is something very similar. If the number of iterations is at least condition number, uh, same condition number as before, no change whatsoever. But now there's a maximum between condition number and one over probability squared. Okay? Then, and this is the probability of evaluating the proxy, that's the probability of communication. So there's a small number. Then, certain Lyapunov function will be below epsilon. What is the Lyapunov function? It's a combination of what we had before with proximal gradient descent, but now we also have distance of ht to the h star. So since we prove that this Lyapunov function goes to zero at the linear rate, because there's logarithmic dependence on epsilon, we, we actually prove that these shifts that we produce, they actually converge to the optimal shift, which if you had from the beginning, you can skip all the communications, right? You remember that, right? Okay, uh, but uh, let's ignore this. Let's just, let's just, in your mind, imagine that this just means we solve the problem. But let's, let's look at this, because this is the important thing. So this says, that you can improve on proximal gradient descent. Why? You will not improve in number of iterations because this is, a, this is a number of iterations of proximal gradient descent is L over mu times log on epsilon. And this is maximum of L over mu and something else. So it cannot be smaller than L over mu. So the number of iterations is not going to be improved. What is going to be improved? The number of proxy evaluations. 
because we don't have to choose p is equal to one. If we choose p is equal to one, our method actually becomes proximal gradient descent. And it will evaluate proximal, proximal operator in every iteration. But if you choose p smaller, but not too small, L over mu will still be the maximum here, right? So you have to choose p to be as small as possible, but not so small that uh, L over mu will, will not be the maximum anymore, right? So what is, what is the choice? Well, just make sure that one over p squared is L over mu. So p is one over the condition, square root of the condition number. That's exactly the result that we have. And that's the number of local steps in expectation is square root of condition number, right? So let me pause here. Yes? Initial what? Uh, in, in any way. And in any way, any way, doesn't matter whatsoever. Could be, it, just, just like in optimization, you can start from any point and it will, you get convergence. Is here is the same. The H zero could be any vector of initial shifts. Could be same, could be different. Uh, yeah, well, actually uh, in this formality, we work in the, we just have just one H uh, naught. Right, but if you work at the distributed implementation, then somehow the, these H nodes have to average to zero, I believe. So then, uh, I think it's good to start with zeros in the distributed setting. But for this non-distributed theory, this is more general theory, which we can then apply to the distributed setting. The H node can be anything. Okay. Okay. So so now all we have to do is optimize over P. But what do we want to optimize? We want to optimize the expected number of prox evaluations. What is the expected number of prox evaluations? It's uh, the probability that in each iteration you evaluate prox times the number of iterations, right? This is the simplest expectation ever, right? Just probability times, you know? So we, we know what it is because we have a bound on P from the previous theorem. We multiply by P and we get this expression. And that's exactly the expression I was showing in the table. And now you, you, you have the simplest convex optimization task ever, just minimize the maximum of two convex functions. And what happens is just this picture. One of the convex functions, this one looks like this, linearly increasing. The other one is one over P, that's this blue one, right? And uh, you minimize the maximum, so the maximum is this, right? And uh, this is minimized exactly at this point where they meet. And in this case, condition number I chose to be equal to two, and the optimal, probability is one over square root of the condition number, square root of two, exactly, okay? Okay, so, so, so in general, what's really happening is that the number of total gradient evaluations is the same as gradient descent, but there are many, many, many fewer prox evaluations, which is what matters because we assume we work in the system uh, where the local computation is so much cheaper than communication that we kind of don't care about it. We only care about communication and we get the uh, effective acceleration of communication. So, yeah. So, okay. Yeah. So, you don't need to know this condition number because the result says uh, this is the general result. So, the probability doesn't have to be one over square root of the condition number. If it's anything between one over condition number and one, you already get improvement over gradient descent because that's exactly when this thing is better than L over mu. So it's very robust to the choice of P. Just choose it small and not too small. But there is a little bit of hyperparameter tuning, yes, involved. Okay, so I'm essentially done in the next 30 seconds. Can I have something like this? I will not talk about this. I will only show you these experiments you already saw. So this could be better than extra of acceleration, but here's another experiment. So this is how the theory for our method, Proskip does compared to all the other methods in theory that are known so far, supported by theory. So if you do everything according to the theory in those papers, there's a gap of many orders of magnitude. However, one of these methods, which is bad in theory, is super good in practice, that's the scaffold, but uh, in practice, you need to choose, uh, you need to go much beyond the theory and choose much larger step sizes than the theory allows. So maybe scaffold is also a very good method. It just, it just has uh, suboptimal theory. 
Okay, so we have two extensions, one to stochastic gradients and one to decentralize optimization or arbitrary connected networks. But I will not talk about uh, uh, the results, but they are in the paper. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, I have one question. So when, when you put the stochasticity in this, in yes. this context, yes. say that you want to, to do, for example, uh, local stochastic gradient descent, uh, how does this go through, for example? So that's exactly this extension. Mm -hmm. So you can replace the local gradient by stochastic gradient. Yeah. You can still have theory, mm -hmm. but the theory that we did here in this paper was for simple stochastic gradients, which are not very reduced stochastic gradients. And then, of course, something gets worse in the theory, but it's still much better than all the other stochastic approaches to local methods. So there's a huge difference. But uh, yes, stochasticity is uh, combined. And all that you need to assume is unbiasedness and this kind of inequality, which we call expected smoothness, which we kind of proposed a few years ago. And it's a general kind of inequality, which is always going to be satisfied whenever you do subsampling almost of any kind. So it's a particular upper bound, which, which depends on the, uh, on the Bregman divergence of F and there's some constant. Typically in the literature, people ignore this completely, but it shouldn't be ignored because through subsampling, you're not getting inequalities of that type, but you get inequalities of this, this type. Very good. And, and uh, then from there, you can go even to try to play, to play local variance reduction techniques on top of stochastic. We variance. already know how to do that. Yeah. And the, the paper will be finished this week. Okay, yes. great. So you're going in the right direction. Yes, yes. Obviously. Yes. Uh, okay, more questions. Uh, yeah, thanks for the great talk. Uh, Thank you very, very much. Nice microphone. Uh, very engaging, and, and uh, I, I'm not expert in, in distributed uh, optimization and on this problem that mostly relate to reducing communication. But I was wondering if the same ideas could be applied also in a more traditional setting where there's no communication, no distributed computing, but maybe there are like a two op lock operations to be done on a single you know, computer, but one is very cheap uh, and the other one for some reason is very costly and you don't, you don't want to do, I don't know, I can think of two PDEs that, you know, some sort of constraint. Maybe, I, I have no idea. So you're thinking uh, very big. Uh, it's certainly an interesting question to ask, but I have really no idea. I didn't think about it at all. Yeah, because I, I, I've been. I understand what you what you ask. Yeah. Yeah. The sort of constraint optimization where, where one has a very com very heavy. Well, know. the constraint optimization we can do, right? So essentially, instead of projecting onto the constraint in every iteration, you do it in every square root of kappa iterations, and you can solve still solve the constraint optimization problem in the same amount of time, but with less projections. So yeah. that's the corollary of this work. But that's still optimization. There's not this genericity that you are really reaching for. Yeah, maybe we can chat later. Yeah. Thanks. Yes, absolutely. Um, and that's a strong assumption. Yeah, it's a strong assumption. So uh, do you think this can be relaxed uh, somehow? We think so. But, uh, <clears throat> but, uh, uh, I know of a simple trick how to do it, but it's not really good. So you, uh, you get some kind of results, but I'm not happy with yeah. those kinds of results. And I don't yet know how to do that. I honestly didn't think. But in, but in uh, numerics, um, uh, you were able Yeah, absolutely. To, in numerics, it, it, it you know, works. You, you could also work in a convex so setting. It can be done Even in non-convex setting, people apply this. This is now in production. Actually, if you do, hey, Siri, that's fairly the learning using local update methods. This is now implemented and in use and ship, except nobody's any understanding why if, this even works if in it's here. It's uh, highly uh, non convex. It's non convex and so on. So, non convex would be much more challenging to do anything. Uh, so, that will be the next challenge. Uh, the second Absolutely. question is um, can this be extended to, uh, I don't know if uh, people apply conjugate gradient method on, on uh, N workers? Uh, so maybe so so this local acceleration through local work leads to the same theoretical results to what uh, you know, conjugate gradients or Krilov suspect methods do. So if you don't use these kinds of methods, you have linear dependence on the condition number. If you use for quadratics, you get square root of condition number dependence, right? That's what these kinds of methods do. 
So, but that's all in the world of quadratics. So this is in the in a slightly larger work of things that are not quadratic, but kind of approximately quadratic because they're upper bounded, lower bounded by something quadratic, right? So, and, and, and we say that uh, you can do acceleration there too, but the acceleration is from local work. It's a different source of acceleration and it's acceleration only of communication, not of computation. Yeah, thank you. Could we have arbitrarily different distribution? Yes. But uh, still, uh, what can you comment about the model? Uh, can you have different models, say, if you're using some kind of uh, deep neural network? No, here, everybody is trying to find the same model. They're collaborating to find a single model. This is not a setup where they are trying to find different models. Yeah. But uh, you could potentially apply it to such formulations because they, are, they will be just different formulations of the same mathematical structure, finite sum optimization. Okay. And uh, in fact, I even have one project running uh, exactly on that. So, okay. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yes. Computer workers, does it make sense to consider them dependent, so some of them are important, some of them less important, maybe introduce some covariance matrix between uh, workers. It does make sense, and the importance in the theory is captured through the Lipschitz constant of the gradient. So if you look at the theory, then in some sense, typically in these kinds of first order methods, you would see that the, if the Lipschitz constant of the gradient is small, then the contribution of that worker is smaller and, and, and the worker is less important. So typically it would be seen through that, but we don't really have a result of this type here. Uh, we, don't see, we don't see that effect. Okay, thank you. It'd be interesting to think uh, why, yeah. Yeah, so, so the theory is generic, it holds for any dimension, right? But of course, uh, in every communication round, you communicate the d-dimensional vector. So that's the effect. So every communication will be more expensive because you communicate a larger dimensional vector if the dimension is larger. So, so that's the effect. But from point of view of theory, no, no effect whatsoever. So if there are no more questions at this moment, we thank again the speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, just a note on logistics. We have a break now until 2.30 uh, where we reconvene for Professor Howard Lewis' uh, talk. And uh, that will be the last talk of the day. After that, we have the reception and the, the poster set up. We will already start discussing posters and I mean, And then we, at that occasion, we'll have some words from Dean Omar here. Okay, thank you.